Good morning. The following show doesn't represent the opinion of the IBL, its employees, or the local clown college. I am the supreme irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson, and I took the left at the valley. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. 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 From the Avengers Super Secret Studio of CFL 101.7 FM, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin and I smash. Joining me as usual is the team of Guardians who foil alien invasion on a regular basis. Our shielded patriot maiden of history, Nancy. Hey, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the show, wherever we are. (laughs) (laughs) Our ironclad armor debunker, Tyler. We need a coffee maker in here. (laughs) Our Viking goddess can swing a hammer, Martina. So pleased to be here again. And our deadly assassin friend in spandex, Jeff. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Hey, guys. Welcome back. Uh, We kind (laughs) of started the show in a bit weird way, but let's do a bit of chit-chat before we go on on our usual things. Uh, On a personal note, I want to say there's a friend and a listener of the show, and uh, she's leaving today. Our friend Sorina, she's leaving on a cruise ship. Yeah, she works on a cruise ship, and she's going to be gone for the next six months or so. so oh, I was prepared to be really sad. Now I'm <laughs> envious. <laughs> My dearest, good luck out there. We're thinking about you. Did you guys hear about that transgender clinic in Montreal that was actually firebombed? Yes. Do you have any more details about it? I've very, I've got very nothing about it because it's barely made the news. Uh, but I, what was interesting to find out is it's the only clinic in Canada that does this kind of thing. Yeah, that's what I read, and and the fact that there's very little news seems to be upsetting a few people, but not enough to make a difference. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's too much Canadian apathy. I was just surprised at that, and of course they haven't quite found the the person yet. But I mean, I've got nothing to say. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a religious coup, but you know, I, I would put my money there. No, if they if they ever have the will to really find who did it, that's the question. I, I well, I don't want to go all conspiracy theory. That's Tyler's job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the conspiracy theory debunker, I would say. <laughs> but there's the other related story. I think it was you, Nancy. I saw you post it. It was um, Justin Trudeau's planning on, I guess, providing more human rights to people with transgenders. Yeah, they're going to have, um, they're working on some laws for some equal protection of transgender people, which I think is wonderful, considering yeah, in, the, in the States they're doing everything they can to take them away. Welcome to Canada. We love you. Come on up. <laughs> use, our, use our bathrooms. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because I took a picture of the one of the bathrooms right here at the university where it says non-gendered bathroom. And there's a little man, little woman, and there's one that's like halfway through and a little handicap sign too. So so it's basically a bathroom. It's basically a bathroom. Where you go and pee. Yeah, just like in your own house. Exactly. Jeez. I know. That's a novel idea. Shocking. <laughs> so you can stand or you can sit. Ooh. Sarcasm is thick with this one. <laughs> and I guess I, ne- I need to remind everybody that next week is Imagine No Religion 6. Woohoo! Ooh, are you excited? Kevin? Yes, because I'm going to be there and I'm going to be interviewing uh, the amazing Randy. And I'll be interviewing Michael Shermer and Brian Keith Dalton, Mr. Deedy. And if I'm lucky, maybe I'll get AC Grading as well. So. Where is oh, it? Oh, man, what a lineup. It's going to be in Richmond. It's at the, oh, geez, now I don't have the address. It's, I believe, the uh, Pacific Regency Hotel, I think. Wow. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, great conference. Anybody who's actually been the, to one of these conferences, they'll say to you, it's one of the better-run conferences around the, the entire continent, I would say. So way to go, Bill. We're rooting for you. And uh, what kinds of questions are you going to ask? Well, I was hoping you guys would come up with those. Have you asked the listeners if they could come up with any questions maybe well let's do that right now you go ahead and ask them that hey so you just heard that uh kevin our famous host is going to interview famous even more host. famous people <laughs> yeah, i'm not famous <laughs> in any way shape or form and so why not come up with some interesting questions you always wanted to ask mr deity the amazing randy and michael Sharmer. exactly be some well fantastic yeah so you can email us at Left, left at, at Valley Left at Valley at Outlook dot com or left at Valley at Gmail. 
Dot com. Yeah. Dot com. And Dot there com. seems to be quite a misconception that James Randi no longer has the one million dollar challenge. He does. Really? Because I read that too. Yeah, he does. I posted it. You and I were in, I think it was in my group that we were talking about it, and somebody said that, and I corrected them and posted the link that explains that he's changed it a little bit because he doesn't want to deal with every little corner quack out there. <laughs> yeah, can so, you understand that? Yeah, so now they're just being a little more specific, trying to get more famous people, I guess, people who are known for psychic abilities and blah, somebody blah, blah. a bit more serious. <laughs> yeah, so the money is still being offered. People so just got confused. Here's your chance. If you have psychic powers, uh, you can find water with uh, dowsing rods, or you can just talk to the dead, or, I don't know, something like that. You can win a million dollars and put all of us skeptics in our place. Here's your chance. Just call the James Randi Educational Foundation, and uh, we'll have a double-blind scientific test with you, and that's it. That's all you have to do. It's been on for bucks. decades, right? And nobody's oh, yeah. even passed it the preliminary test because they're all cheating. <laughs> you know the funny the funny thing is is the the, the scientists that are there. It's not like they're not they're not putting some kind of huge standard you can't pass. They actually agree to the test with the person actually doing the test. So the person doing the test agrees to it and says, "Okay, this is a fair test." And then they go through it, and of course that it doesn't work. So, what was my sound effect for that? I don't have. One. I, I suspect some of the people that uh, challenge it actually truly believe that they can do what they mm -hmm. claim to. They're, they're, I don't think that they're all scam artists. Some, no, no, I, to actually, I totally agree. I think a lot of people actually truly believe they have these powers. Yeah. But you know, we're easily fooled. All right, Nancy, you ready to go? I'm ready to go, That's whether I'm up. ready or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, okay, ready here to go we go. With it. Yeah. All right. This day in history. Oh, whoops, whoops. Uh, I'm too ready. There we go. There we go. Uh, there we go. Okay. And as we know by now that this day of history is a roundup of those events and individuals that altered and illuminated the days between May 9th to today, May 15th. Starting with May 9th, it was Europe and Victory Day. Uh, Europe Day and Victory Day in many countries which celebrated the end of World War II. May 10th was Flower Day in Azerbaijan, and the only reason I put that in is because it's fun to say Azerbaijan. Sometimes it's not the event, it's just the country that's fun to say. It's a little inside tip to my uh, ability to research if I find a nice name. It's in. Anyway, in 1872, um, Victoria Woodall became the first woman nominated for U.S. presidency, uh, and the party that she belonged to was called the Equal Rights Party, and it occurred at Apollo Hall in New York City. Um, Victoria Woodall was an absolutely fascinating free spirit of a woman, and I encourage everybody to look her up. Her last name is W-O-O-D-H-U-L-L. -L. It's just fascinating to, to see her history. May 13th was Friday the 13th, which uh, was kind of fun. Anybody get get trapped in a Friday the 13th incident? Or no, I, we all survived? I, I escaped. You escaped? We <laughs> <laughs> all survived? He's still chasing me. He's at the door with a yeah. machete. <laughs> so the, the fear of number 13 has been given a scientific name, which I'm going to butcher, but I'm going to give it my best shot. It's Triskaidekaphobia, which is from the Greek. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Triskaidekaphobia. I think I did it. Um, which I think is, it's try actually. Okay, I didn't Don't do it. Don't spoil it. No, 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 no. That's okay. Which way is it, Tyler? I think it's try, like because try is T obviously Triska. Try, try Triska. Whatever it is, you're right. Okay, <laughs> moving along. It mean it, in the Greek it means Friday and thirteen put together. So the superstition surrounding the day may have arisen uh, in the Middle Ages from the story of Jesus' Last Supper and Crucifixion, um, in which there were 13 individuals present in the upper room, um, and the night before his death was on Good Friday, um, that there's no evidence of the number 13 really being unlucky uh, before the 19th century. There are little stories here and there, but it's possible that the publication in 1907 of a very popular novel called Friday the 13th at that time contributed to 
to disseminating the superstition. Um, in the novel, a, a superstitious broker takes advantage of the superstition to create a Wall Street panic on Friday the 13th. Or it could be that in 1307, Philip IV arrested hundreds of the Knights Templar and did away with them. In any event, here we are, and we still um, have sometimes the fear and sometimes uh, just the outright celebration of Friday the 13th. I thought it was 1309. Uh, 1309 was the, the when Philip uh, the, 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 the fourth. Yeah, the king with the with the pope, right? Right. That's what I always heard. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, we get to May 15th, which is today, which is the International Day of Families. Okay, Kevin, I know that one of your very favorite history stories is the grapefruit story with oh, Ruth I Law love and. That story. <laughs> It's a wonderful it's throwing story. the ball, throwing the ball out. But I think this one is going to rival of the top three stories that we've told over the couple of years that we've been active. I think this one is going to go right to the top. But does you, it, you does it have fruit? <laughs> <laughs> Any story with fruit, I'm good with it. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really, but anyway, this this one is it's a fabulous story. I've researched it. As far as I know, it's true, or it's an elaborate hoax that everybody repeated. But I'm going to go for go for true. <laughs> so it, there's no set date for this. So I assigned it May 15th, and it has to do with American spying uh, just after World War II. So here we go. There is a date, but we'd have to kill you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So at the height of the Cold War, officials in the U.S. hatched a covert plan to keep tabs on the Russians in Washington, D.C. And this comes out through um, some CIA documents that were released in 2001, and then they were corroborated by others who were involved in this project. So the, the high-minded you know, high spy masters decided that they would deploy surveillance cats. Surveillance cats. Surveillance actual cats surgically implanted with microphones and radio transmitters. And they designed the program so that these cats would slip by security and eavesdrop on activity in the Soviet embassy. So the project went by the thinly disguised code name Acoustic Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds uh, like a bad Christi porn. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I know. So they had a vet surgically operate on the cat. They put batteries in him. They put little receivers <laughs> in his ear. They wired him up. They put an antenna in his tail. I mean, they they. Please didn't tell me the thing didn't vibrate. <laughs> <laughs> saving saving that to the end, so uh, the um, a gentleman named Victor Marchetti, who was an exec executive assistant to the director of the, of the CIA in the 60s, actu actually corroborated this account in a book called The Wizards of Langley. So anyway, the, they used the tail as an antenna, and they made a monstrosity of a cat, and then they trained the cat on, on how to you know, deal with human beings and how to deal with going around corners and take orders and all that. They spent up to $10 million getting this cat ready wow. to spy. That's Some say two. That's uh, more than the bionic man. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> absolutely. And who wasn't nearly as cute. <laughs> So so they, they got him designed, they got trained it to operate, they trained the first acoustic kitty, and when it came time for the inaugural mission, the CIA agents got in a car and they decided that the inaugural event would be to take this little rookie spy agent and have him spy on two guys who were meeting outside the Soviet embassy. So they took him in the car and they had this nondescript van and they watched as these guys came, you know, to the spot where they could be monitored and they they released the cat as he set out on his mission. So Acoustic Kitty out of the van, dashed toward the embassy, making it all of ten feet before he was unceremoniously struck by a passing taxi and killed. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I, I know. There they were sitting in the van, and the cat was like fur pancakes <laughs> on the, uh, uh, you know, on the roadway. And I'm sure that if you bent over, you could just hear the static emanating from the from the tail. That right. Poor, that poor cat was one day away from retirement. One day. <laughs> 
<laughs> Even if it's not true, it's still damn funny. I know. Can you imagine the look on these two CIA f- field agents as they, as they watch 10 million bucks smacked in the, into the cement? Oh. So eventually, the CIA scrapped the project, <laughs> having to have to account for the, for the millions of bucks. And it, so 1967, that was it. And, and according to some of the redacted documents, this never happened. But they did try the acoustic kitty, but they took everything out of the cat, and then the cat survived, which is a, a fairy tale version. But I like the <laughs> not one of violence, but I love that version. <laughs> you You're can right. That, is, that, <laughs> that did just become one of my favorite stories, too. It, isn't it? It's just great. It's kind of zoomed to number one. We'll see if it stays there. <laughs> All righty. So at, at any rate, the, the uh, George Washington University still has the archives. And uh, despite the energy and imagination, as they say, of those involved, it wouldn't be practical to train cats as spies. <laughs> so that, dear listeners, brings to a close, or a bang, I guess, <laughs> Another passing parade of interesting, mundane, unusual, and today absolutely bizarre events and people that make up this day in history. <laughs> you know, history class would be so much better if we had that kind of <laughs> lesson to learn. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. I know. I, know. Thank you so much. I love that story. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Uh, let's do a segment we haven't done in a little while here. It's time for in confession. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. This is the segment where we confess something that happened to us, and I want to hear what you guys think about this. Here's a quick little story. Um, you know, sometimes you get people coming in and buy, and usually children, and they sell you stuff and get to do some fundraising of some kind, right? That happens to all of you. Well, a couple of months ago, there was a nun that walked into our front office and was selling calendars. Now, of course, you know, I told her that, you know, sorry, I'm an atheist. I can't really <laughs> help you with your church there. But the funny thing is, is a couple of weeks ago, same thing happened to me again, but with a child. A small child selling calendars. She was at- giving away children? No, of no. <laughs> no, 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 no. The nun was not, no, there was no nun this time. <laughs> Let me be clear, and she was not giving away children, but a small child, a small girl, came and she was giving out, well, selling little calendars for donations, calendars of Jesus. Clearly the, you know, white power Jesus, all white and, you know, the curly hair and all that. And I blurted out, you know, I, I, I said to her, I kind of called myself out, but I said to her, I said, oh, poor thing, don't you know that this is all made up? <laughs> Now, was I wrong from doing that? Was I, I love a, you, Kevin. Was I a, jank, a gigantic jerk for doing that? Because I, the, the, the look of horror on that little girl's face was just like, oh, my God. But, you know, in a way, I'm thinking. Oh. How, how old was she? Oh, I would say probably less than 10. Would you have told her about Santa? That is a good question. Like that, you, might, you might not have done that. You might have kept that dream alive. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. But in a way, you know, plain devil's advocate for half a second there. If you, if I mean, this is definitely not her initiative, right? This is the church's initiative, and they're trying to. T- I think they're trying to tug at my heartstrings by putting a kid out there sure. to yep. sell their paraphernalia. So if they're doing that, in in a way, aren't they fair game? Well, you didn't specifically say Jesus was made up or the Bible was made up. You just told her it was made up, right? Yeah, I, okay. well, yeah, that's what I said. I said well, well, it doesn't know. matter if you did, though, because Santa's not a fair comparison because there isn't a lot of bad things that go along with it, like homophobia and that kind of thing. And Santa is temporary. How many 50-year-olds do you know that still believe in Santa? <laughs> well, the, the, the issue is, 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 I think, a fair comparison in the sense that the, Kevin's question is, um, was it was it wrong because of the child's age? I'd like to see what the Christians would say if they had a kid that came to their door and had like a calendar of Thor or Odin or something like that. You know, they would say the same thing. Well, That's not real. What? Of course, there's always a. Double, They'd be double so standard. shocked. Of course, of course, there's a double standard. But I, I yeah. think I think the question's fair, uh, Kevin. That you know, at some point, 
uh, I think some things should be maybe left to the parents or maybe the child's too young. I don't know. I think it's a fair question. Santa, sure. Jesus, no. Yeah, I'm, ju- I'm just wondering, did I did I just crush her dreams or did I send her on a journey of discovery? Well, how did she leave? The question that I would have, Kevin, is how did she leave? Did was she, she in tears? <laughs> yeah. No, no, she wasn't okay. in tears or anything like that. Well, you got to remember, so it's a young child too, right? So she might not have even have really grasped what I've said there, uh, but... There was a bit of a look of shock to her right away, and you say, okay, you know, all right, have a good day, sir, and she kind of walked away, and part of me kind of felt like a big jerk right there, but at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know, the the, the, the real jerks in there are probably your folks and your church sending you out there to do these things, you know, trying to sell something that you, uh, probably, you probably don't even understand fully yourself. But I, I think that it's, I think that when it comes to children, I think that, like, for example, I'm thinking of a, a situation that I had. Uh, I had uh, uh, some neighbors next door to me uh, in the neighborhood that I lived in, the Christian family. Uh, there was a father, a mother, and three children. And the two boys were quite young at the time that this do- happened. And they were probably seven and ten. And my children would always talk about evolution and science and things like that. And somehow it came up. And, and um, I was sort of conscious about the issue of saying too much to the children with the thought of being respectful to the parents i I know that might sound you know odd on this show but i felt like it wasn't necessarily my place to give these children conflicting ideas if the parents were there and the parents said go ahead jeff tell tell them what you think then i would feel differently about it i would have no problem but i felt like i feel like it's not necessarily my place to raise other people's children. But if I had said yes and gave her five dollars for her calendar, am I reinforcing the doctrine? Well, that's another question. Yeah, that's another issue. Well, I, I don't think that's either or. You could have said no, thank you, but you're a very sweet little girl, and thank you for coming in. You don't have to say you feel bad because you well, didn't no. buy the calendar. Yeah. It's just I think the way it's not like I looked at her and said, yeah, "You exactly. fool! You believe in this crap? What are you doing?" I do have one question though: the nun's calendar. It wasn't like the fireman's calendar that was topless, was it? <laughs> no, no. Oh. But you know that would have actually made it more interesting to see Jesus <laughs> like that. You know. I don't know if some kid came to me with a calendar and was trying to raise money for like the flat earth society or something I would have said yeah that's a load of crap kid by the way <laughs> well we can uh, always count on you for being really PC there <laughs> well thank you so much for that guys and we'll be right back right after this are you ready to make it stop Canada has the highest rates of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in the world and the diseases are on the rise in kids under 10 join Crohn's and colitis Canada on Sunday June 5th for the gutsy walk at over 60 community walks across Across Canada. It's time to stop the pain, stop the surgeries, stop the missed moments. Sunday, June 5th, show you've got the guts to make it stop. Register today at gutsywalk.ca. If you want to do some good this year and help your fellow humans, check out the Women's Resource Society of the Fraser Valley. The Women's Resource Society is a secular, feminist, non-profit organization providing help to women and children in Mission and Abbotsford. They have been providing safe refuge for women and children who need shelter as well as support and information since 1984. So if you want to help bring awareness to women, youth and children who are experiencing violence or who are at risk of homelessness, or in need of support, check out wrsfv.ca. Again, if you want to donate or get involved, check out wrsfv.ca. You're on 101.7 Civil Radio, keeping it live from the University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford to the surrounding area. If you value your sanity, keep it locked. Need to feed your fix for Civil? Get off the street and go check out our podcast and live feeds at civil.ca or phone us at 604-851-6307. Hi, I'm the Supreme Irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson from the Legion of Reason Diversion. Join me and my co-hosts, Christine Shelska, Twyla, and Nate Phelps as we explore issues at the intersection of atheism, humanism, and skepticism. 
Topics range from alternative medicine to the interference of religion in public policy. We often have special guests to help us understand the topic du jour. Previous guests include biologist Jerry Coyne, ex-Muslim author Ali Rizvi, philosopher Peter Bogosian, and the late physicist Victor Stanger. You can watch us on the Legion of Reason YouTube channel or subscribe to the audio version through your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to like the Legion of Reason Facebook page. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you can be go? here today. Okay. Okay. And, and anyway. And we're back. All right. Now we got a special guest. Nancy, you want to introduce our guest that uh, actually just called it? Oh, I sure do. <clears throat> Actually, um, say hi, Kim, so we know you're live and, and with us. Kim, got you there? And I'm uh, really honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, terrific. All right. Excellent. You, Thank you for, for being with us. Absolutely. Um, so that was the, the, the voice that uh, is, you're going to hear uh, a lot just more. Just so you know, I suddenly got some background music that's overpowering you folks, just so you know. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. All right. <laughs> no problem. Okay, here we go. Well, our our guest for, for this half hour is Kim Hines, um, who is an advocate um, in Victoria, B.C., and Kim is an advocate for human rights, for anything that has to do with, uh, with, with the suppression of marginalized people. He's just right there, and, and one of his hot spots is uh, guaranteed annual income. So, um, Kim, take just a, a moment and tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about your background before before we turn the show over to Tyler and get into uh, the, the basic income in Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm uh, currently involved at the Committee 10 Homelessness Victoria and uh, working on a particular working group called the Anti-Poverty Action Group. And on both those, we, we support the livable for all income. And I was born and raised in the north end of Winnipeg, single mom on welfare. That's not your fault, by the way. Uh, p- pardon me? Winnipeg, that's not your fault. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, my home. That's where I was born. It was in Winnipeg, North End. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but currently I'm in Victoria, so I feel very far from home. Um, and right now, that Liberal Income uh, Conference is happening there, and I'm so happy about that. And I'm I couldn't go, which I was disappointed about. And I just put my little bit in there about the Lived Experience Advisory Council. We're a, a cross Canada group uh, where we formed off the Canadian Lions Den homelessness. Um, three of our three or four. Four members are there currently in Winnipeg. I'm really happy about that. But yeah, I was raised in poverty, single mom on welfare, and um, my mom said that I was always someone who questioned things and asked about things. And we talked, you know, up until the day she died, we would talk about bigger issues. And uh, when I found out about Martin Luther King and the livable income, I just, it took me a long time because I have fibromyalgia. Um, I have memory issues, so I have to really read through things for sometimes quite a few years to really understand it. And uh, so I've been, I kind of did that for a while and just recently uh, developed more of a focus because I was really concerned about why were the unions not involved. So my specific, you know, kind of focus has been Martin Luther King's work around unions before he died with the, uh, um, the poverty campaign. 
and uh, how that happened. I'll get into that more later, but but I just now have been you know finally figured out why why there has been a split, and and it's interesting to kind of know that now. I don't know if I if I said enough there, but I I'm involved at Ten City, and I was really happy. I just want to share the good news about that is that people at Ten City developed their own stand, you know, sort of uh, things that they wanted moved forward, and they generalized it into four points. And I was really happy to see that uh, people on the ground brought up a livable income as one of the points. And uh, I was proud about that. And there was some big discussion on the ground about that for me, uh, who, you know, I was homeless for quite a few years on my own from 15 to about 22, 23, um, did drugs, went through that whole thing, uh, went through child abuse, uh, because of violent alcoholics who were generationally abused and generationally poor. So, I mean, even though I had a lot of anger towards the people who abused us, I learned about oppression and learned about generational abuse and generational alcoholism and generational poverty and how they're all very much linked. So it's so really no... Martin Luther King's yeah. work in ending when he spoke about how he realized this was not just a race, not merely a race issue, but also a class issue and... He started working with unions, and I'll stop there. So we can, uh, yeah. So we can understand why you are a, an absolute advocate for mm-hmm. um, uh, guaranteed income. So, uh, Kevin, are you ready to yeah. turn the show over to uh, well, the Tyler? Just, just, just before we unleash Tyler, I just want to do a quick segment with you guys because I have you here. Let's do. Okay, I just got it. Since we're talking about poverty and all that kind of stuff today. Did you guys find out that the apparently the Supreme Court of Italy has ruled... Can you ruled turn the music off for me? No, but I can reduce it. How's that? It's just harder to hear you. Thank you. I can hear you now. All right. The Supreme Court of Italy has ruled that stealing to satisfy a vital need for food, one of the basic needs of life, should not be a crime in the country. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw that yesterday. Yeah. Apparently, in 2015, a court in the country sentenced uh, a poor and homeless man to six months in jail for stealing common cheese and sausages worth $4.50 from a supermarket in the city of Genoa. So, uh, Roman Ostriakov is said to have migrated from Ukraine to Italy, but life has been very difficult for him. He sleeps on the streets and begs for food. In 2011, he visited a supermarket and bought breadsticks. While uh, When the supermarket attendant was not looking, he picked up two pieces of cheese and a packet of, so- a packet of sausages, put them in his pocket. So he was arrested. A customer saw him, so, so they, they arrested him. Uh, and then the court decided to essentially, Supreme Court of uh, Cassation ruled that the theft of small amount of food for the hungry or poor is not a crime in the country. The court therefore ruled that he should be freed. The Supreme Court uh, reviewed the application of law and uh, of Mr. Ostriakov and not the facts of the case and the mandate, uh, this is the mandate of the court. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, starving people should be criminal. Yep. So does that does that not set a bad precedent though? Like, I mean, is it going to be a free for all for anybody who's hungry to go steal a sandwich under ten bucks? <laughs> that's a you know that's a good question, and it's a question that a lot of people would ask. Well, I would assume I would being being a half optimist and half cynic, it would be wonderful if this led to some improvements. For instance, let's say that uh, there were signs in the store saying that if you didn't have enough money to pay for your food, that they could make arrangements. Let us know, and we'll make arrangements for you to be able to get, you know, what you what you need for your family. Something on that order, and then being able to actually refer to different agencies, so you don't have people with money coming coming in and taking advantage yeah. of it. But it is, it is a, a move forward if they work it out you'd, the you'd, right you'd way. You'd have to, to be very specific and clarify because if they write the law too broadly then somebody said, you know, walking off the street, oh, I'm hungry, I can grab something, right? Because some people will use that kind of system and try to take advantage of it. And I, think, I think most people wouldn't because their social status and guilt, like I know plenty of people who need charity and they refuse to take it because it makes them feel bad, right? So people aren't going to go out and be taking food because they feel bad about it or they think that it makes them look bad. You know what I mean? People don't like to appear to be poor. Well, I I think that what's going on in Italy, plus the fact that uh, France has outlawed um, destroying any food, throwing food away and making it available, I think those are advances that that eventually they'll work work themselves through the the system so people can still have dignity and eat at the same time. Yeah, and uh, we should almost do a show on that. Uh, Put all this in uh, with the the fact that there is so much waste 
of food all around the world. Well, and what's that France thing that we were talking about where they made a law that supermarkets aren't allowed to throw out food? Yeah, that's what that's you gotta what you got to give it to people like that Roman guy. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, and you know, the funny thing is that even here in, 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 in Canada, a lot of supermarkets will not give food away because they think that if they, uh, they give the food away and somebody gets sick, uh, they will be sued. But that's not true. There is a Good Samaritan law that actually protects you from this. But it's okay yeah. if like 7-Eleven takes the food. So it's, no, we can't give you this food in case you get sick. But I'm going to throw it in the dumpster in like 10 minutes and then you can go get it and you'll be fine. Oh, it's worse than that because a lot of places like McDonald's know exactly. So they, they have uh, new dumpsters that prevent people from actually doing the dumpster dive. There's a compactors. There, there's a restaurant. I think Ward told me about this in Vancouver that sort of that skirts the guidelines on that. Instead of throwing it in the dumpster, they actually have a table in their alley and they just put the food and they set it up there. And the people that are living in the area know when it's coming. And they're sort of like, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I was just going to suggest that, and obviously better. somebody thought yeah. of that. Yeah. There's one place doing that here, and here they've had legal battles where people who are dumpster diving for food, not bombs, for example, they started putting locks on the food, so they put the food into a dumpster where they put a lock on it, so they made a political event out of it and a social kind of, you know, can, you know, kind of shame them campaign. But the market on Yates still locks up their stuff, but other markets, really great, other wonderful markets that sell organic food, um, don't lock them up, and they'll do it where they put the stuff that's still decent outside the dumpster a few hours before they close up. And some of the stuff that's really obviously good to leave out, and it's gone by the morning. Cool. I wonder if yeah. it's all just a liability issue that they're concerned with, or is it? Or are there some uh, sort of retailers concerned about cannibalizing potential market? It's, your your buddy, someone else mentioned that there's a law that it should it should be fine, but it's, it really it comes with a right wing agenda. It, it hit us the pre Olympic time when they started doing that more like police state security culture being told to not allow it, lock up your dumpsters. Don't, you know, it's a real, it usually comes for some reason with conservative times. And, uh, okay, okay, hold, hold on, hold on there, hold on. Be- before we go too much into that detail, let's remind people we're doing the show today on basic income guarantee. So we should <laughs> deal with that properly because people could not have to worry about food if they had a livable income. I totally agree with that. But with that, I'm going to unleash the Tyler and you go, dude. The mic is yours. Okay, so instead of me just talking, maybe we can actually all have kind of a discussion about this. I'm not sure what everybody knows about the basic income guarantee. Um, I have tons of different sources for this. There's actually a really, really good TED Talk about the basic income guarantee that kind of addresses all the concerns. But instead of me just talking like a talking head, as you say, uh, I want to know what you guys think would be the common objections to the basic income guarantee. Then maybe I can answer them and give you some numbers. Okay. Um, won't you, if, okay, let's, let's, let's put on my conservative hat here. Some devil's advocate. Devil's advocate. Uh, if you guarantee basic income for people, won't you take away their drive to go out there and succeed? Yeah, and now, and there's tons of experiments. Uh, the Canadian one was in that city in Manitoba, Dolphin, or maybe I'm not pronouncing it right. Yep. But Dolphin. what... What they said after this experiment, which was four years from 1974 until 1978 under the NDP government, of course, and then the conservatives got elected and completely squashed the entire program. But they said, oh, look, young men quit working and uh, women tended to quit working, you know, small percentages. But when you actually looked at it, the, the adult men who had stable jobs, there was no change in the amount of hours worked. It was the young boys who were going to high school. They were the ones that quit working. So if you actually look at the details, it was a positive thing because exactly. more kids were graduating high school. And back then, maternity what's maternity leave now? How long do you get? Six months? In Canada, I believe it is six months. Yeah, back to a year. Back then, it was four weeks. So the women, the women used the basic income to stay at home with their infants, you know, to breastfeed and stuff like that. Those were the only groups of people who stopped working. Because if I give you, if you're making $1,600 a month, right, minimum wage full-time, roughly, and then I give you an extra 1600 on top, are you going to be like, sweet, now I quit working? No, I'd rather make $3,200 a month, right? Because then your life actually really, really increases. So they, the conservatives were basically trying to cherry pick the data and say, oh, people are quitting working. But that's not the and, case. Yeah. And uh, just to put one little note, the conservatives are often worried that it would make it a people's movement because people would be more involved in the work that they love because people can't do nothing. They often have to do something. Oh, yeah. Martina, you volunteer yeah. like crazy, right? You know how <clears throat> bored you would get if you didn't? So, yeah. But even Milton Friedman, 
who I hate, by the way, um, he supported the basic income guarantee as well because it really does take the government out of it. I mean, mm-hmm. instead of paying all these social workers at the welfare, you know, paying for the welfare buildings, the electricity, the water, all that stuff, all you're doing is either sending a check or directly depositing, you know, roughly sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars a month into everybody's account, and then they go out and they spend that money, okay, and it uh, boosts the economy, right? Let me let me just uh, put put a bit of a break here for half a second. Um, yep. We all know here what we're talking about, but if somebody out there in the audience does not exactly know what it means, the basic income guarantee, would you be so kind to give us a brief explanation? Sure, free money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, no, but that, that's what the guy says on the TED Talk, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, they also call it negative income tax, that sort of thing. It's just it's basically giving everybody the human right of enough money to be able to eat and hopefully, you know, have a place to live and that sort of thing. So the government would subsidize you to a, uh, a poverty wage? At well, least. No, actually, it wouldn't be. All it is is a, redi- it's a redistribution of how things go. So instead of having employment insurance and welfare, you'd be able to take that completely away because the minimum wage, for example, would be a livable income. So all the jobs would have to get ethical. They'd have to start taking care of their workers, and everybody would have more equity and be actually treated with d- dignity, and you'd have more union jobs happening because then that would be happening. You'd have, you know, So if we do it from the ground up, it's great. There's some right-wing people, if you notice, are into it, but their versions are very different than Martin Luther King's or ones that involve unions. You know, so it's really good. I really recommend that people look into his, his uh, you know, the work he was doing. It actually goes Indian. back further. I traced it back to Thomas Paine being the first person to mention it. goes way before it. him, but he, he kind of modernized how we can do it locally. Okay, so anyways, like he was saying, like Kim was saying, they take disability, welfare, social security, all those mm-hmm. things, and kind of put it into like a monthly payment for everybody, right? No matter what. You don't have to qualify, that sort of thing. And with basically the prediction is that within 10 years, it'll have paid for itself because these studies have showed that it decreases, totally. uh, it decreases a lot of health care issues, whether it be mental, whether it be just physical health in general. It decreases crime. You take homeless people uh, off the streets like, you know, they eliminated homelessness in Medicine Hat by just giving them houses, right? Yep. Essentially, giving them this money is also kind of like giving them a house. It's paying their rent for them, right? So, and homeless people are ridiculously expensive because of health care costs, because, you know, paying law enforcement, those sort of things. So e- even without taking the disability and the welfare and all that and combining it together, it still pays for itself. Are there any legitimate concerns or uh, cons, of, if you will? I've looked and looked, and this seems to be one of the subjects that the left wing politically and the right wing politically actually agree on. How much it's going to be is kind of well where they differ. But, I mean, we've got Martin Luther King Jr. on one side agreeing and Milton Friedman. You like, I don't think they agree on anything else. <laughs> there's, so, there's, sort of a, there's sort of a sense in our, in our culture that there's ways to get ahead, whether it's uh, sticking with a company and moving up through the ranks or whether it's getting, uh, taking courses, advancing your education, working harder. There's, there are various ways that we can advance ourselves. Is it a potential disincentive to uh, advancing through those means uh, by subsidizing, you know, so traditionally lower paid jobs. No, I've looked at all of the complaints from the conservatives. I even found libertarians who support the idea, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. Well, hold on a sec there. If the, if everybody's supporting this idea so badly, then how come we haven't implemented it yet? Richard, we Nick, do have a yeah. small percentage of people running things, and we are kind of in a systemically oppressive state. So, Well, how many people know about the Manitoba experiment? Not many. How, exactly. How many people know that Richard Nixon tried to get one pushed through? Yeah. Most people don't know that. It just doesn't get a lot of coverage. Everybody's a little bit more concerned with... Uh, Big Brother and Survivor and all that. Crap. Well, the, the big, the biggest issue is the the right out of the gate. You're you're cutting checks to people, uh, you know, without really understanding what the long term effects are. That's why there's a pushback because all these positive uh, net gains that you're talking about happen over time, whereas that check gets cut today. So that's the challenge, I think. Well, and th- that, the thing is that the studies we haven't done a provincial study, and they're looking at starting this year in Ontario at doing one. All the studies, we've had some in Uganda, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, exactly. the one here, they all work. The problem oh. is they're all very small scale at the moment. So we need to obviously test it more and, and take a skeptical view of it, see if it'll work provincially. If Maybe if it works provincially, we can extend it to 
our entire country. But so far, all the complaints that I've seen from everybody have already been addressed. Oh, family, it's going to increase the divorce rate. It didn't. It didn't increase the divorce rate. People didn't quit working. Well, no, because people have more they, more, they feel more solid in their relationship because then there becomes more equity. So then you don't have that same power struggle. It's, that's why the divorce rate didn't go crazy right away because the equity was more there and people started treating each other that way as soon as you know you have it, right? Yeah, and financial stress is the number yeah. one cause of divorce. Well, I always Big say one. marriage is the first cause of divorce. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if uh, you, can I, I just want to say one thing for people to please read Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? by Martin Luther King Jr. It took me a long time to find it, but it's on the web now. I highly recommend because it helps to understand why he worked with unions so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very pro-union as well. But if you want, yeah. you guys can look up uh, why we should give everybody a guaranteed income. It's a TED oh, Talk yeah. on YouTube. Uh, I also have a Facebook group called uh, Canadians for the Basic Income, where I've basically taken all the links that I've you know, been reading about it and posting it there. There's actually a really good talk from this woman. She's a uh, economist, a Canadian economist. Can't pronounce her name for the hell of me. Uh, but she actually went over to Finland and did a lecture there, and I was listening to it this morning just trying to refresh it, and she basically deals with all the complaints that she was getting from you know people who were worried about this, saying people will quit working. No, they don't. They actually took 13 homeless uh, people, like chronically homeless, like some of these people yep. have been homeless for 40 years, and they started giving them basic income, and within a year... The majority of them had houses. They were taking cooking classes, gardening classes. I mean, Absolutely. The, the problem is that some things are just counterintuitive. You think, I'm going to give these homeless people money. Yeah, they're all going to overdose on heroin within a year. That's just not what happened. Thir thir no, and the reason why that whole thing happens is criminalization creates that whole dangerous, violent situation. It puts everything underground and creates this whole illegal everything. So, I mean, the decrim movement, and that's, that's really important movements along with the livable income because, I mean, let's face it, we need to act sooner than later. We don't have the kind of time generations before us knew we had. And it's, it, you know, when people are given an opportunity, suddenly they want to garden. Seriously, down at Ten City, garden, build, take care of each other. These are things that we, if everybody did. Those are jobs. They're women's jobs, but why not honor them and have them be part of the little I mean, I mean, think about it that way. Like, we are in those kind of times where I don't think it's going to be another test there's an election coming up, and I'm pressuring NDP locally, including uh, David Eby, to make it happen. I'm not asking for a test. I'm asking NDP or Green to go with it, and I, I would vote for whoever would start one in the next election. We but don't have but Jeff, Jeff is correct. Like, so far, the studies, the largest studies that we have, I think, are like in just, you know, tens of thousands of people. So that's, totally. why this, that's why this Ontario thing is such a good idea to try this out on a much larger population, and if it works, like I said, extend it to Canada. Well, what, I, is, I what, is Trudeau, what does Trudeau stand on this? Does anybody know whether or not he would be uh, behind a, you know, to, to try it provincially? Maybe, a, I don't know how they would do it, a city at a time not, in each province? Not locally, B.C., uh, Christy Clark's government right now, just forget about it. They're not even no, no, she said Justin Trudeau, though, because this Ontario thing is supposed to start this yeah. year. There's no details. I didn't find... No the, details from Trudeau yet. I didn't find anything about the amount... Uh, no. The basic income stuff that I've been reading is proposing $20,000 a year to everybody, uh, which is basically around sixteen sixty a month. So minimum wage is what here a month? Basically 1700 a month if you take 1025 the, you and know, multiply it by 40. We did 40. a study years ago, not that long ago either, and it was really good. I think it was like at least sixteen or 1800 a month. Was the minimum yeah, so it's right. basically minimum wage, which yeah. obviously it's this is the minimum amount you can survive on, so that's what you should be getting. I, I know yeah. people who make less than minimum wage doing other jobs, and I'm like, that doesn't Absolutely. make any sense. Hold on, hold on here a sec. Don't, don't you have to take into consideration the cost of living? I mean, the cost of living here in the Fraser Valley and Vancouver yeah. is much higher than it is in Medicine Hat. I think what they would do is they would look at what um, the minimum wage is in B.C., versus what the minimum wage is. And there's other places in Canada where yeah. it's $12 an hour, right? So you would take that and then you would multiply that by 160 because people typically work 160 hours a month, correct? Yeah. And then that's how you would get your number. So you'd, it's either 1025 multiplied by 160 or whatever, is it the Yukon? I don't remember what province it is or territory that has $12 an hour. You just multiply 12 by 160 instead and that's yeah, how you get your number. You're right. And they, they're, they're pushing for 15 just for current, like right now everywhere they want a 15 an hour and work that out to a, a monthly 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. And there's actually yeah. a really good article by this guy named Andrew Coyne. It's called uh, Guarantee a Minimum Income, Not a Minimum Wage. And he explains why an increase of minimum wage is not as good as a guaranteed income. I agree. And that basic income becomes a minimum wage. That's a step. Yeah, basically. And you're yeah. not harming small businesses by saying, oh, by the way, you have to pay your you know, 100 employees an extra $5 an hour. I, I think uh, at the risk of being the sole devil's advocate here, I think, I think that conceptually, philosophically, this is a great idea. There's a lot of value behind it. But I think actually implementing it, there, there could be some negative outcomes. I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking about, um, and you know, Tyler seems to be disagreeing with this, but there could be a disincentive uh, within some people to to maybe work harder or get ahead or advance. Okay, themselves. but you have. Hang on one second. You have, there's no evidence for that, though. Hang on one second. There is absolutely evidence for people in union situations that don't work as effectively and as hard as non-union situations. There's absolutely evidence of that. Okay, but that's not the same but thing. That's kind of not true either, in a way, though. In some ways. One hundred percent of the studies with the basic income guarantee, people do not decrease working. Oh, well, I'm it's talking about how hard you work. Any, if any yeah, of you have ever worked, we're on talking a union, about basic income. If any of you have ever worked on a union job site, which I don't know if you have or not, then you'll clearly understand what I'm talking about. But again, a hundred percent of the basic income guarantee. Not just one country. This is France. This is Uganda. This is Mexico. Brazil, Canada, yeah. the U.S. Th- all of them. People don't quit working. The other, I, I never said quit working. I said work harder or work. I mean, you have it's all about kinds production. There's this idea that they'll produce less if there's a guarantee. Yeah, that's, that's that's none I, of those things have decreased. All of the studies true. and you can't Uganda work actually increased by thirteen percent after implementing the basic income. The other thing that I was going to suggest is that I wonder if there's a potential for some employers to take advantage of this. If you're having the government somewhat subsidize these workers' I- incomes. I wonder if you're going to see employers somehow find a way to take advantage of that. For example, offer uh, lower paid jobs or something like that, and then just know that, well, the government will top it up. Well, we still have, they, there would still be minimum wage. People wouldn't be able to be like, okay, now I'm paying you $5 an hour. They try and make it worse. Well, hold on. I think Jeff's got a point here. If you take a, a, a good company, which I won't really name here, <coughs> Walmart, uh, <laughs> they they do exactly that. They, they they starve their employees and they actually tell them how to navigate the uh, food stamps and all that. So they could be, essentially, or the government is subsidizing this giant multinational company. So then they're already doing it, even though there isn't a basic income guarantee. But the argument is that they might start doing what they're already doing if we implement no, it. That exactly. they no, that's not they the argument. They might keep trying. They yeah. might keep trying it, or it might be more widespread. For example, there might be a marketplace that that requires to pay its uh, employees 18 bucks an hour because that's the marketplace. But then you got this new system coming out, uh, guaranteed income subsidies from the government, and all of a sudden every new job that this company comes out with is now a minimum pay- minimum wage job because they know well, that. Well, no, that's, yeah. It, it, can't, it can't happen if you think about the, ex- oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, just say, it, that can't happen when you think about people who are empowering themselves to have a voice, and there's people who went through years of university and are specialists in their field. Even in, I think, Venezuela and Argentina, they respected that those people got paid more because they had more bills because their education alone cost them six digits or whatever. So people, you know, will get paid for the work they do. I think in unions that's respected for the most part or should be. Well, this would be a non-union situation, $15 an hour job, and now this new in, uh, new um, system comes in place, and from then on in, uh, all the new jobs that come out are not fifteen dollars an hour because they know that the government is subsidized. I think we're underestimating. And don't get me wrong, I like the concept, mm-hmm. no, it's a good but point. I think I think we're underestimating the greed of uh, the free market. No, I think it works the other way because if they're going to decrease the amount they're paying them, people are going to not take those jobs because they don't absolutely have to because they have the basic income guarantee. In order to get them to work, they'll have to pay more. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think I th- it would have the opposite effect. People aren't going to be like, I have to take this lower paying job because I'm screwed if I don't. Now I have the basic income guarantee. Screw your $12 an hour. Either pay me more or I'm just going to go somewhere well, there, else. There, or not, there would no, ne- they're not there so would, dependent on There would not be a $12 an hour job. It'd be $10 from the company and $5 from the government. Okay, well, well, I think Whatever it works out to be, but you can't get paid $10 an hour in Canada anyways. It's below minimum wage. So we still have those things it. in place and... Th- thus far, every single experiment around the world 
hasn't had any of those complaints whatsoever. Nancy, you want to say something? Well, I think in any economic revolution or change, you you have things that happen in the in the marketplace that aren't going to make everybody happy. That these things are are going to evolve. They will work out. I think the main question is by by utilizing or by putting in place a minimum um, uh, basic income. Are people better? Are the the people who now are starving, who can't afford homes, who are uh, taking you know money uh, on welfare, or having a miserable time trying to get ahead? They can't break up the cycle of poverty in order to get into decent jobs, decent housing, decent education for children. If we give those people the advantage of a guaranteed income, is society as a whole going to be able to benefit? And are we going to be able to work out the other problems of are you a slacker? Are you an activist? Are you producing? Are you not producing? But mm-hmm. it is, is the guaranteed income going to be in the long run a more beneficial Official and humane and, and compassionate and, and better economic system than we have now. Well, and there are tons of studies that show that money is one of the primary stresses in people's lives. And when yeah. people are less stressed, they are happier, they are physically healthier. And when you are happier, you are a much more productive employee. I guess the question really arises is no matter what the system, there are some people that will find ways to uh, buck the system. There are some people that will take advantage of it. But do you overall throw away the system because of a, f- to use a bad really uh, analogy, a few uh, rotten apples? Well, and I've tried yeah, looking at this. Like I've always tried to debunk myself before somebody else does, and I tried to tear this part, this idea apart as much as I could. And I looked at all the arguments against it and for it, and so far there is no actual data that has any negative connotations to it whatsoever. I mean, there's a bunch of hypotheticals. This might happen, and this might happen, and okay, maybe, but there's all the data is supporting it. But okay, what if we don't do this? I mean, think. I mean, think about it from the other side for a second about like how bad it is now, like just how horribly oppressive and greed capitalism has taken over and can i mean can we maybe try and think about how the people who are going to be freaking out are the ones who probably killed martin luther king that's just my opinion but um conspiracy theory around (laughs) uh, white and black coming together to work you know to change the economic system um and so i mean i don't know if we how to have that conversation not sure Hmm, that's an interesting question indeed. So, okay, guys, in conclusion here, because we're three minutes away from uh, shutting down the show, uh, if we were to go that way, um, it's not something we could just flick a switch and happen. Or, or do you guys see some kind of procedure or some kind of uh, ramp it, wrapping up to it? Well, I think that we would have to start with something smaller. Like the Ontario Project sounds pretty good. I mean, like I said before, it's all been really small experiments. So I don't think we should go from where we are now to all of North America or all of Canada. I think we should do a province and then another province. It's like healthcare. Healthcare started out in Saskatchewan and then it spread, right? Yeah. We had to kind of test it out and work out. There's always bugs in the system. Every time you come up with something new, there's problems and then you have to figure it out. Okay. okay. Have you looked at, um, Tyler, you've done can, a lot can of... Can we go around and answer that question? Just after Jeff's question. Yeah, no, I just just to this uh, point here, uh, and I apologize for not being as informed as, as the rest of the group on this issue, but, um, you know, when things seem too good to be true, they're often not, so I'm, I'm sort of trying to be skeptical about this. Have you looked at or has anybody looked at how affordable uh, this would be in terms of what the uh, initial cost would be? I'm reading something here on the Internet. It says, uh, in 2012, an affordability, st- affordability study done in the Republic of Ireland found that a basic flat tax of 45% would be required to implement a program like this. I mean, that's going to be something that's going to have a lot of pushback. Is this thing affordable? You know, I mean, fl- they, they flat, f- flat tax is ridiculous, but there was an economist, it mentions in the TED Talk I was talking about, saying that in order to pay for it in the United States, keep in mind they have what? How many people is in the United 200 and some? In the States, about 350 million. million. Three, okay. Anyways, for them, they said it was about $170 billion a year uh, to pay for it, so obviously it's going to. We're, they're ten times the size of us, so it's going to be cheaper for us. But like I said, you're taking all those welfare programs that we're all paying for, disability, all those, putting them together, and like they said, it decreases crime. It you know the homeless thing is yeah ex- we know costs are yeah the homeless thing is extremely extremely expensive. It's like a hundred thousand dollars or more per homeless person. So all these things will pay for themselves. Not to mention 
you don't have to pay all those welfare workers anymore. You don't have to pay for all the buildings. It's as simple as printing and sending a check or direct deposit or whatever. Last word I for you, it, Kim. Go for it. I just want to jump in to answer the question about what we thought could happen. Or Make whatever. it quick. I would highly suggest that people read that Chaos or Community book, but also I think every major city across Canada and each province, um, that's my goal the next federal election, or we may, you know, we ask Trudeau to do this, that every major city in each province uh, should be doing the test because there's been enough studies, there's like, like books and books and books and studies and studies and studies that can answer all these questions, including how much it would cost us if we were to do it now. You can go to Twitter and get that answer in about five minutes. It's pretty weird, but cool. So, yeah, there's my, my goal. And I think it is going to happen quickly, like how revolutions do. And we're kind of at a time now with Fukushima and animals and environment and time Thank to you. make a change. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate that. Nice and talking th- to you, Kim. Thank you for all of us and all of you for listening and <laughs> being on the radio with us. Coming up, we have... Uh, who do we have coming coming up? We have the Homeless Show coming up. Yes, we have the Homeless Show coming up. And don't forget the Imaginal Religion next week as well. We'll have uh, James Randi soon with us, and we'll have Michael Shermer, um, Russell Glasser, Tracy Harris, Phil uh, Ferguson. We've got a whole bunch of great things coming on the pipe. Until next time, guys. It amazes me how perfectly intelligent people can reach the conclusion that all non-believers are evil. What a fucked up statement. Do you realize what you're saying? But according to your book, this is how your God made me. Skeptical of anything that contradicts history, denies evolution. Mystery. I'd rather see the truth than to bask in my own ignorance. Rather be alone than surrounded by damn idiots. As long as there's a breath in my body, you can bet your last dollar I'll be working hard fighting this problem. Religion is a disease, it comes from culture. Only true on a regional scale. Science is universal. Or you can say that Horus isn't real, but Jesus is. Or Zeus, Thor, Mithra, Vishnu, you don't believe in them.